So, as Mark said, uh, what we're going to be doing this afternoon is playing, in, in all cases, original music. This is, uh, maybe we'll do eight or nine different things, all, all written specifically for Nick or for mm -hmm. Debbie and uh, originally in the context, uh, the normal context in which we work uh, is with a sextet. Going back about eight or nine years ago um, at Webster University where I direct the Jazz Studies program and where Nick uh, teaches and where Debbie teaches as well, uh, Debbie arrived as an adjunct faculty member. This is 98 or 7, somewhere around there, 6. And um, I had never written vocal music before, ever, or attempted to. Um, and I realized that there was this amazing vocalist who was present there. She was teaching the jazz curriculum. She is a soprano section leader for the St. Louis Symphony. Um, she actually has performed as a soloist with the St. Louis Symphony in Carnegie Hall. Um, she ha has a reputation for being a new music expert in town. Uh, where, for instance, the symphony-sponsored chamber music series, if there's some particularly challenging, uh, quote, modernist pieces that feature the soprano voice, um, she's uh, often the pe person who gets the call to do that. So there was this amazing vocal artist who all of a sudden dropped into my life, and it was like, well, I should try to write something. This is after years of writing music. I have been, uh, as vehicles for improvisation in various small group contexts, Specifically, uh, originally a group going back to the 1990s, uh, led by a guitarist, some of you might know, named Dave Black, uh, Kevin Giannino, and a bass player named Dan Eubanks. We had a, a basically a writer's workshop. It was a band called Brilliant Corners that in the 90s was pretty busy around town and uh, only ended when the bass player moved to Nashville uh, at the end of the 90s. But I wrote a lot for that group and uh, as everyone did, uh, Dave Black in particular and myself. And then from that, I wanted to, for instance, learn how to write uh, for a group without a harmonic instrument. That is no guitar, no piano, just the texture of woodwinds, bass, and drums. So I wrote a lot of music in about a two year period for that ensemble, which usually, at least in its final manifestation, was uh, a bass player uh, who I still work with all the time. Uh, named Ben Wheeler and drummer Kyle Honeycutt. And then eventually I wanted to do it for two voices, so I added a trumpet player, Mike Parkinson. And that group uh, I wrote a lot of music for as well. But then with the arrival of uh, this vocalist into my life, it was like, well, I should try to learn how to write for her. And initially it was the question, well, what text do I use? Um, and, and then being a, a essentially a lazy person, except for things I'm very highly motivated to do. I recognize the difficulties of what it would be like if I had to always get permission for public performances uh, of the estate uh, of whatever poet you know, I would choose to, to write from. So I said, well, I've always liked, I've always had a, a bent for literature, and I've always liked poetry, so I'll just start to try to write some things myself. Uh, and as with most things that one is new at, uh, most of the early stuff sucked, uh, <laughs> but over time it, it started to, uh, to, I started to get some positive feedback from what was then a sextet. Nick on, on keyboards and uh, Ben Wheeler and Kyle Honeycutt uh, from my trio guitarist, Dave Black, my longtime collaborator, and Debbie and myself. And uh, push comes to shove, now I've probably written maybe more than 50 things for her to sing, and this includes text. So uh, the more I've gotten into this, the more meaningful that the whole notion as a starting place for the music is in fact the words. What it connotes, the vibe that it creates, the mood, uh, and so forth. And um, it now has gotten to a point where for me, and this is the, uh, the really the moving force in any writing that I'm doing right now, and specifically for this configuration is that having written words, it really gives me an opportunity to do something that normally uh, improvising jazz musicians today don't do, which is to have the mood of a piece, the feeling of a piece, uh, really dictate the way the music goes. Because so often, I think contemporary jazz improvisers, 
what you are given is some sheet music that includes a melody and a, some chord progressions, and you improvise off of that. Um, but usually, very often, the music progresses uh, to a place that a lot of people, the musicians who are improvising, have been before, uh, which involves you know, grooves of, of various tempos. Uh, and a lot of times, what people bring with them as improvisational language in a setting like that is what they play regardless of what tune they're playing. You start to see over time, unless the musicians are exceptionally creative, you'll start to see the same licks, the same patterns, a lot of the same vocabulary. So it was like, well, I don't really, I've done that and have uh, myself been guilty of, of that kind of uh, reiteration of the same basic language a lot. And it was like, well, what could be a door that would help for me and the music to go through that other motivating factors would be present? And that becomes this idea of the text, which I'm really, really committed for, committed to. And um, so what you'll be hearing once Debbie arrives here is, is vocal music, almost all of it uh, recently written. And uh, the idea of the fact that most of, most of these pieces have been written for a sextet. Um, on a couple of occasions recently, Nick and Debbie and I have done it just with the three of us, without the bass, without the drums, without the guitar. And uh, especially in a more intimate setting like this, it seems highly appropriate. For one, because the, the musical relationship uh, can be much more sensitized and organic, provided the acoustics are good. Um, and as you will hear, uh, Nick defines sensitivity as an accompanist, as far as I'm concerned. True. Um, he has a, uh, you know, uh, a remarkable sensitivity that's present in, in everything that he does. And he's a superb accompanist to Debbie. So we'll get to all of that. And actually, I want to, when we finally get to the place where we're performing these tunes, I'll give you a little background on each one, the source of the text. And I also printed them just for the reason that I've always been rather irritated when you hear a vocalist, especially in a, in a pop or contemporary setting, where you hear the sound of their voice, but you can't always hear what they're saying. And uh, I think given uh, that I wanted this to be a, a a full experience for, for all of you listening and for us performing, that I did take the, the time just to uh, allow you to have the, the lead sheets on the, with the words on them and so forth. But uh, we're going to start just by playing a piece uh, that I wrote. Actually, this is the only piece that isn't recent. Uh, this was written on New Year's Day 1998, or New Year's Eve 1998. Um, it's what's called a contrafact, uh, which is a new melody over a familiar set of chord changes. And anybody other than Jerry Green who recognizes what tune this is will get a free cookie. <laughs> 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 what, what tune this is based on. All right. And I said that about Jerry just because Jerry will immediately know what tune it is. <laughs> what, what's the original here? Thank mm -hmm. you. 
buddy? Jerry? It's called, oh, you stepped out of a dream. Okay. Um, I think I'd like to, uh, well, first off, over the course of whatever talking we do uh, between pieces and so forth, I welcome your questions anywhere along the line. Uh, so pe please feel free to, uh, to ask any questions uh, that, uh, that you would like. I would like to say, if, since we are in a saxophone shop, <coughs> and um, everybody here has an interest in that instrument, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about my own uh, in terms of what I write, and this I think this will become maybe more meaningful uh, when we get into the stuff of the book with the voice, uh, my own uh, uh, sub very subjective inclinations about the voice of the different members of the saxophone family and how I hear them. Uh, so for instance, uh, the tenor saxophone, I, I really hear is, a, is an instrument that's pitched in a minor key. I mean, I think because of the, the fact that it's in the range of the male voice and especially the robustness of the, of the low end of the instrument. It really has a plaintive quality. And I've, uh, in writing for it, as you'll hear the first piece that we do uh, with Debbie, that um, I, I, I hear it as an instrument that you can chant with. Uh, I think John Coltrane taught us that specifically in regard to if you know the fourth movement of the Love Supreme Suite, for instance, that's done out of tempo, where he's more or less reciting, uh, or a piece called Alabama that, uh, that he recorded in 1963, uh, which has a similar kind of meditative vibe. Uh, for me, the tenor saxophone, because of the, the, the plaintive quality of it, really lends itself to minor modalities. I hear it as a, as a melancholy sort of instrument. That's not to say that, that uh, I don't write uh, uh, more upbeat things, but I think that it tends to be a lyrical and, and plaintive voice in terms of what I write. Uh, I also love to try to exploit the fact that uh, I tend to hear on the tenor saxophone, it is a, a pretty dark instrument, as I said, not just in terms of emotional con but content, but also sonically, that is, uh, I really very much uh, admire the, and respect and am intrigued by the sound of the way the tenor saxophone was expressed through the hands of the great instrumentalists of the 20s and 30s and 40s uh, before the music, before rhythm sections became very loud and before the saxophone came progressively brighter, the tenor saxophone. Uh, just out of the need to be heard, uh, that the sonic dimensions of the plane of somebody like Coleman Hawkins or, or Ben Webster, if you're familiar with it, or Lester Young in the 40s, um, that sort of dark and multi-hued orientation to the, to the low part of the instrument to me is really attractive and something that I'd like to retain and, and I think I write in that direction certainly. The other place for the tenor in terms of what I write is also the burn. I mean. And this is again something I guess that Coltrane taught us that uh, that you can you can really uh, create a great deal of heat at up tempos. We won't you won't hear that today in regard to the tenor, uh, but those seem to be the the two primary directions in which I, I write for the tenor. Uh, the alto, by contrast, to me is a is a, a major key instrument. I just tend to hear it as being something that's uh, that's inherently uh, more positive, um, uh, more positively declamatory, shall we say. Uh, I hear it as a conversational instrument. It always seems to me to have a speech-like quality to it. Um, and uh, when I use the alto today, uh, maybe you'll hear some of that. But I, in particular, I, I think I'm drawn to the example set by people like Lee Konitz, the great alto player who's, who plays in, in a exceedingly lyrical fashion, but without a great deal of overt expression. It tends to be uh, like a real elegant, refined statement, oftentimes done, done uh, with a, a great deal of uh, restraint 
but when you get inside the content of it, it's 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 really quite quite meaningful and, and beautiful, and, and uh, that's a kind of a, a guiding place for me as re as far as the alto is concerned. Uh, the soprano, for me, um, is an instrument because of the fact that the hang time is so great for the notes, meaning that because it's pitched in the same range of the trumpet, you can just play a soprano saxophone note and the instrument will just, I mean the note will, uh, can just exist comfortably above the fray, the fray being what's provided by the rhythm section, the bass, the drums, and all that. I think the reason that tenor players play so many notes a lot of times is that they're down in the range with the left hand of the keyboard, uh, where the, the bass player is, where the bass drum is, and they're oftentimes just trying to fight their way to be heard out of, out of the bottom of the band. Similarly with, uh, I think, trombone players have the, sort of the same problem in the modern era. Now they have the facility to play fast and high, and they do. Uh, similarly, uh, the tenor saxophone is like that, but the soprano, for me, is an instrument that really uh, begs for uh, a great deal of, I don't want to say austerity, but it's a, it's a, it, it is receptive of a very minimalist approach, uh, where the notes can have a lot of space on either side of them. I think the, the soprano is particularly attractive in that way. and uh, I just a very subjective opinion, when I see soprano players who just burn all the time, play lots and lots of notes, it's like, well, uh, that works well, but I think that the, the real expressive potential of the instrument is lost if you don't leave a lot of space around the notes. And my guiding light is that regard is, in that regard is this guy named Steve Lacey, who uh, devoted a lifetime to pursuing a study of the saxophone, of the soprano saxophone in jazz. Much of his career uh, unfolded in Europe but he's really a studied minimalist in terms of his writing. Uh, we'll do a piece a little bit later that uh, I actually wrote it sort of in, as an honor to him uh, and is reflective of some of his musical values. Um, and then uh, the bass clarinet, which is something that is uh, something I'm beginning to explore. And uh, to me, it, it sort of serves three functions. It's sort of like three instruments, for one thing. It's got this very sensu sensuous low end to it that, of course, can provide uh, bass lines and, and bass notes and so forth. Um, and then it's got the mid-range, um, which has a distinctly different character than the robustness of the low end of the horn, uh, maybe a little more restrained, maybe a little more hemmed in. And then the upper range can be quite open and plaintive and voice sounding, uh, vocal sounding. Uh, and it's neat to try to, uh, to uh, find ways of, of, of using that, and we'll do a couple of things with the bass clarinet today. Um, any questions about anything, saxophones or otherwise? Baritone sax. Uh, I don't play the baritone. <laughs> if, is Derek, anybody want to comment on the baritone? Is Derek around? It's big and heavy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's Jeff, uh, there's Jeff Collins. I wouldn't know how to comment about like writing for the baritone, but it's, it's similar to the, the uh, bass clarinet. You know, you have your low end like bass potential, you know, and then you can write it voiced up high with with the rest of the saxophones or voice it with trombones. Um, and when it when it comes usually to soloing on the baritone in groups uh, typically you'll see most baritone players like play real furiously like lots of 16th notes and stuff like that because they're trying to stay above like mm -hmm. the the frequencies of the band and it's hard to as a very player solo in like a <clears throat> modern ensemble it's hard to like be heard a lot of times so a lot of times you'll either get somebody playing like all like double time or like all in the upper altissimo register which is you, which you can't do on the baritone uh, quite effectively, but then you're not like playing in the baritone register anymore. So mm -hmm. that kind of makes sense. Yeah, baritones are really unique instrument because it, it can serve in multiple purposes. It can have that lyrical quality, like a hearing organ or a Nick Bird kind of thing, or it can have a serious bark. Uh, you know, uh, for example, in a in a blues band where it serves the purpose of the bass in some instances, it can delineate the five one progression. Uh, so the very Barry is a fun instrument to play because it can have multiple roles, um, and it depends on the ensemble you're playing in or how you want to write for it. But, uh, 
it's kind of an instrument within itself, I think. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask Nick's opinion about that because Nick is was, was his his degree is in composition, and he's a, a very facile writer and, and uh, orchestrator. Do you have any opinions about the baritone no. at all? Or about <laughs> <laughs> Everything Zach said is right on that. It's like the 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 Barry Sax is like the unsung hero of any big band, I, right? I think because it's yeah. like doing too. It's you know it can do. Can play with the trombones, yeah, or you thing. know, depending on how you want to ride with it, it can be voiced with any section in the band. I think it's having a resurgence with contemporary music. You know, you're hearing a lot of funkier mm -hmm. tracks because that's come back in the boat too. Mm -hmm. So it's it's cool. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's big in Indian music, depending. On the, yeah, because they like that low drone on the C. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Anyway. Cool. <laughs> yeah, man. took Tower of Power and Veritone could be way more like a bass, very percussive. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah he, was, he is such a great player. I, I presume, is he still active professionally? Oh, yeah. 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 Amazing. You guys, hopefully, everybody knows that group. Um, um, let, let, me, let me explain. Well, for one thing, I, I am stalling for time just a little bit. Uh, the deal with Debbie Lennon is that. Uh, the vocal jazz ensemble that she directs at Webster, where we all teach, uh, is having the run through for their final concert, which is Monday night. And it was supposed to be over at 2, and she would be here. So, at any rate, um, any other questions? Anybody? Okay. Um, let me guide you into uh, the, the, the first piece that we're going to, to play. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, let's do this. We'll wait until she gets here. Let's just play something. All right. I'm just going to, uh, for the moment, just do some kind of standard, uh, if you want. Or, yeah. Okay. Do you mind if I play the music? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Nick's going to switch over to, to the other piano. Why don't you just play in front? Play, play chords in front. Bravado. Thank you. 
Mm-hmm. 
should you should feel comfortable with it. I feel great. I just want to make sure everybody. Okay. Can. All right. Yeah. So if it's audible, um, we're going to continue with something I'll play bass clarinet on, and uh, this is called. This is uh, actually uh, more or less a transcription of some dream imagery. That seemed like uh, it had potential as a piece. Actually, I need two stands. Walk out with this one?
curve. Uh, I had mentioned Steve Lacey earlier. This is something that suggests uh, his writing style and his playing. Uh, the text is real edited. Uh, Debbie also uh, will improvise using some uh, text comments that she made or added to this piece. One, two. Oh, my goodness. What a difference a day makes. Yeah. Okay, I'll adjust it from here. Thank, Thank you. you. You're so sweet. Okay. Thank you.
she was right If yesterday was any measure of the way you think You know it all
suggest upward motion, but beyond that, it's kind of nonsensical. Uh, we're going to play around with this. We're going to treat this sort of as a slice and dice approach to this tune, where uh, segments will be repeated and circle around, etc., etc. It'll, uh, it's just word play, essentially, and uh, we're treating this uh, in a much freer way than some of the other things that we've done. Let me up here. Uh, yeah, the bass clarinet comes back on on this one. Yep.
touch of thought Faint as a whisper Behind the next word At the tip of a finger Below the skin At the corner of sight Off to the left In a vision of night Along the way Right under your nose In the hint of a smile In the blush of a rose In a sliver of white On a shift in the wind Near the turn in the road Where our footsteps begin
South is a sun Far north a lonely moon And stars rise in the east Across three thousand miles of straight edge roads That you won't ride But on this flowered night, the buzzing in your ear is here to follow on its jagged way from note to note and song to song. What lush hothouse warms is rare strain. that opens into every
It's here to follow on its jagged way. 